Thank you very much, everybody, for coming this evening. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And thank you, Russell, for not just coming, but coming early. So we had a nice chat upstairs and downstairs in Waterstones. Um, I'm just going to take a show of hands first. Uh, does everybody know Russell Jones? Anybody here who doesn't? Good. Oh, a few. Excellent. Anybody regular followers of his Twitter feed? Uh, there you are. But not everybody. So we've got some people you can read to for the first time. Those of you who don't know Russell, um, he's a designer, project manager, and a wazzock living in Cheshire with a ludicrous dog and a cat that would certainly strangle him if it had opposable thumbs. <laughs> to relax, he paints portraits, plays drums, tweets about politics, well, that's a surprise, and grinds his teeth to fine powder while watching the news. <laughs> Not uncommon, I suspect, for many of us at the moment. Um, his Twitter account, which is uh, at Russ in Cheshire, so if you don't follow him on Twitter, now's the chance, currently has over 280,000 followers, eager for the latest updates for his, and I quote, forensic detailing of political goings-on, which this book, A Decade in Tory, I, I, I didn't really want to know it was that big, actually. Has it been that long that you've been here? Anyway, um, he doesn't like, he wouldn't like the idea of attending your party, apparently, and he's made very few public appearances, but I'm delighted he's going to be in Milton Keynes with us this evening. Russell, welcome. Hello. Thank you. So we decided what we're going to do first is he's going to read you a bit. So if you know it, you'll be delighted to hear it again. But if you don't know it, you now know what you've been missing and why you're going to buy a book at the end of the evening. Russell. Hello. Uh, this is from uh, 2018, the chapter is called, An Aggressive and Fruity Meltdown. Let's rewind a thousand years and travel to Bernburg, Germany, where one Christmas Eve in the year 1020, an otherwise unremarkable church service was interrupted when a dozen of the worshippers suddenly began to maniacally and involuntarily dance. They didn't know why. Nobody knew why. They checked the Bible, but God had no answers. The dancers couldn't make themselves stop, and it lasted for hours. Two hundred years later, and a few hundred miles away, another incident. A large group of children started to unwillingly dance, boogieing out of the town and 12 miles down the road, almost certainly starting the Pied Piper myth in the process. Half a century on, a group of around 200 uncontrollable dancers was so vigorous that they caused a bridge to collapse. In 1518, over 400 people spontaneously gyrated for several days and didn't even stop when 15 of them danced themselves to death. You could write all this off as the wild exaggerations of over-imaginative medieval storytellers, were it not for more recent examples of baffling group behaviour. In the 1960s, ambulances rushed to a school in Blackburn after dozens of girls began compulsively moaning and then 85 of them fainted. Medics found nothing physically wrong with them. In Singapore in the 1970s, a group of factory workers began screaming one morning and could not stop themselves. Emergency services were called and did what they could, but not even hospital-grade tranquilizers worked, and the outbreak lasted for a week. This sort of phenomena is called mass sociogenic illness, the compulsive, inexplicable, and harmful behaviour of a large group, which has no corresponding cause. And I mention these events in the hope that researchers might investigate the population of Epsom and Ewell, which, since June 2001, has compulsively, inexplicably, and harmfully elected Chris Grayling to be their MP. <laughs> Most politicians believe themselves to be intrepid and invincible, but not Grayling. He's unfailingly invincible and steadfastly trepid. He is an artless agent of pure chaos, and try as I might, I can find no record of him ever being hatful, wreckful, gormful, or ept. When they put him in charge of getting people into employment, he made 10,000 of his own job centre workers redundant. When they put him in charge of getting, uh, when they put him in charge of crime, serious offences rose by 21%. When they put him in charge of the probation service, his tenure was described as an unmitigated disaster by the British Sociological Association. When they put him in charge of prisons, he relieved jails of a quarter of their staff. And when they put him in charge of transport, 
he somehow contrived to get entangled with his own car door, which knocked over and injured a passing cyclist, and then reportedly left the scene without providing formal details. The home bargains Pennywise entered 2018 trailing a record of calamities that he could wrap twice around the world, and he hadn't even broken sweat. The year began with Grayling being made party chairman for as long as the Tories could trust him not to screw up, which turned out to be 27 seconds. <laughs> His appointment was announced on Twitter at 1.43am, not an hour that screams, we're proud of this. The tweet was deleted less than half a minute later, which, as we all know, was more than enough time for Grayling to fall down the stairs, accidentally glue his own head to a toaster, and set fire to the Queen. <laughs> After his incredibly brief tenure as chairman, Grayling went back to being transport secretary, and was almost immediately castigated by a select committee for cancelling multiple promised rail electrification schemes in the north of England, on the grounds that there was no obvious benefit to spending money in the north. <clears throat> Under the Tories, public spending on transport in London is £903 per head. In the North, it's £276. Hey everybody, gather round. I've found an obvious benefit. To avoid levelling up the country, which was apparently a major Tory policy, Grayling decided to stick with diesel-electric trains for the North. These require twice as many engines and a huge fuel tank. As a result, they're so much heavier than the electric alternative that they damage tracks and therefore cost twice as much to maintain. The operational cost of a single line is £63,000 per day. The National Audit Office discovered Grayling had made this cloth brain decision before the 2017 general election, but he suppressed the release, <coughs> excuse me, he'd suppressed its release because somewhere in the back of what I suppose we must call his mind, he realised it wouldn't play very well with voters. It was literally weeks before his next fiasco came to light. Britain's rail network had announced the largest change to timetables in living memory, and under Grayling's watchful eye, managed to make the biggest cock-up in living memory too. Over 10,000 trains were cancelled or severely delayed. During peak times in just two of the busiest locations in Britain, Greater Manchester and the Thameslink area, two out of every three trains were cancelled. Millions of passengers were affected. There were multiple causes of this mess, all of them eminently foreseeable by a competent minister. For example, for a normal minor change to a route or timetable, its recommended rail services allocate around 16 months to training, so drivers can be sent to training without too much disruption to the network. To prepare 20,000 drivers for the biggest change anybody could remember, the government allocated barely one month. And just as the timetables were due to take place, dozens of track upgrades were being undertaken by giant contractor Carillion. But Carillion had collapsed in January with a loss of 2,500 jobs after the Tories refused to give them financial assistance. Work ground to a halt, leaving disruption across the network. As a result, we were faced with the largest upheaval in a generation, coinciding with unfinished work along hundreds of routes, along which 20,000 untutored drivers would be steering trains they'd never been on before. The warning signs were written in 60-foot letters of fire, so the Quango Grayling was responsible for made an executive decision. We've got no tracks, no preparation and no drivers. Let's do it anyway. <laughs> Four figures are hard to come by due to the fragmentary nature of the privatised rail system, but during the most badly affected week, business losses exceeded £38 million in the Manchester area alone. If you think that's an isolated case, think again. The chaos lasted for weeks and affected the entire country. The government's own Northern Powerhouse Partnership found Grayling screw-up had caused 945,000 hours of lost work just in their area. Meanwhile in London, the crisis caused one company to turn a £130 million profit into a £5 million loss. The editor of trade magazine Rail called it the most chaotic, fundamental and humiliating failure it has ever been my fortune to witness in more than 40 years as a rail journalist. Sir Michael Holden, the retired head of East Coast, Rail, East Coast Rail, said, Never in my worst nightmares did I imagine anything could be conceivably as bad as this. Your worst nightmares clearly weren't haunted by Chris Grayling. I envy you. A report by the Office of Rail and Road found the problem was caused because nobody took charge and that there was a lack of responsibility and accountability. So the Tories held Grayling responsible and accountable by supporting him and against the votes of no confidence and leaving him in charge. Let's move on now to August, 
both Anne Grayling's previous existence as Minister for Fucking Up Prisons had suddenly come back to bite him on the elbow. Or do I mean arse? It doesn't matter, he can't tell the difference anyway. <laughs> Grayling's tenure as prisons minister is best encapsulated by his realisation that even proven national embarrassment to G4S were better than he was, which is why he handed over control of so many prisons to that company. It went about as well as could be expected. In August 2018, when the Chief Inspector of Prisons, Peter Clark, visited the G4S run jail in Birmingham, he found it to be the worst prison I have ever been to. There had been 1,147 assaults during a single year, which was not only the highest in the country, but it was also the highest incidence of violence ever recorded in any jail in England and Wales, ever. It was a five-fold increase since the day G4S took over. Surely, somebody must have been asleep at the wheel, said Mr. Clark. Wheels, said Chris Grayling. <laughs> Startled from a power nap. Hey, I'm Transport Minister. I know all about wheels. He didn't say that. I made that bit up. Of course he doesn't know about wheels. By October, Grayling had redirected his special genius to the roads of Kent, where Tory MP Tom Tugendat woke one morning to discover that overnight, without any warning, the transport secretary had turned big chunks of his nearest motorway into a lorry park. I wrote to Grayling in April, said Tugendat, asking, asking whether or not this would happen. I was assured that works were not planned. Only yesterday it was confirmed to me that this is exactly what was planned, despite having been told the, re week, the reverse a week earlier. Trains? Tick. Roads? Tick. Where next? Ah oh yes, the skies. In November 2018, Gatwick Airport had to close for several days after a drone repeatedly entered its airspace. More than 140,000 passengers had flights disrupted. The army had to be called in, and at one point a drone came within 20 feet of an aircraft carrying 180 passengers. You might think, nobody can blame Grayling for drones, but then you discover he'd ignored numerous warnings about the vulnerability of airports to drones, and only a few months earlier had del deliberately cancelled the legislation designed to prevent it. The disruption cost just one of the affected airlines more than £15 million. Some are born hapless. Some achieve haplessness. Others have haplessness thrust upon them. Uniquely, for Chris Grayling, it's all three. <laughs> Sadly, such consummate ineptitude does not come cheap. During his time in office, the National Audit Office found that personal cock-ups by Grayling had cost the taxpayer more than £2.7 billion. That's the same as a stack of £10 notes over 18 miles high. It's the yearly salary of 80,000 nurses. And he's just one man. I beseech you, by the sacred toboggan of Imhotep, do not let him breed. Thank you very much, Russell. I mean, I think that extract absolutely sums up the wonderful combination of satiric writing, humour, and evidence. And I have to say, although I showed you the book, it does have over 134 pages of footnotes. So, so it's all true. You, you might think you couldn't make it up, but it's all true. So how important and time-consuming is the process of research for the book to you? Oh, very and very. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, I've done this right the way from when I started doing the, the Week in Tory on Twitter. Right from the very beginning, I thought to myself, if anybody reads this and starts having a go at me, I want to be able to say to them, no, this is true because I've looked it up and here are the sources, here's the evidence. So since I very first started doing it, I've, I've kept all the evidence, which kind of helped with writing this because when it came to writing the book, if, I knew that I had bookmarks for everything that I wanted to claim. But I still ended up reading, God, this is a depressing fact, I ended up reading the newspapers for 10 years. I basically sat and read 10 years of back newspapers from the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian, the Mirror. Um, I even dipped into the Daily Mail and the Sun occasionally, but I, I bathed <laughs> afterwards. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's important. And obviously, the publishers as well were very keen to make sure that uh, everything that I wrote could be substantiated. Um, it went through quite a vigorous legal check, which is very expensive and very time consuming, but also very important, I think. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big factor.
I was going to ask you about that, actually, because, I mean, there must be a fundamental difference between putting out a Twitter, a tweet with your views, and actually it being turned into a 400-page book. Now, I know the publisher is Unbound, which is a kind of slightly different approach to, to getting books out than, than other publishers. Um, but also, you, you talked about the, the legal points and the legal checking. Can you just tell us a little bit about the move from, if you like, digital world to the real world of publishing and how that happened? Yeah, um, I, I never, I never intended um, the week in Tory on Twitter. I never intended that to be a thing. None, none of this has been planned, really. It's all just happened to me. Um, I, I around about the beginning of the first lockdown. Um, the government had one of those weeks, another one of those weeks, where everything just seems to go catastrophic wrong and just be terrible. And uh, I just re just did a very short little Twitter thread of things that happened during the previous seven days. Didn't have a hashtag, didn't have any plans for what it was going to be. But the thing that struck me was that the government had accidentally made it illegal to drive to Wales. And, um, I mean, y y it's the satirists I feel sorry for. Because... <laughs> <laughs> You, you, can't, you can't really beat that. They accidentally made it illegal to drive to Wales. Um, and there were about six or seven other things that they'd done the same week. Uh, and I wrote it as a list. And at the time, I had about a thousand followers on Twitter or something. And then the next week, I did another list. And the week after that, I did another list. And the list kept on growing, bigger, bigger and bigger and longer and longer, until I was getting to lists that had 120 points. That they'd, 120 screw-ups in a week it takes some doing. But they were getting to be enormous. And um, it must have caught a publisher's eye because somebody got in touch with me and said, hey, would you like to do a book? Uh, which had never crossed my mind before, really. It's, you know, I, I don't come from the background where people wrote books. Really. I, not many people even read them where I came from. Um, but it occurred to me that just taking a lot of tweets and putting them in a book form, just copying and pasting them, was A, very, very cheap and very quick. And be terrible value for money, really. Um, so I decided instead to, try to write what I thought would be a short, punchy book about the screw-ups that they'd done and ended up being um, this brick. <laughs> yeah. Took me by surprise. Yeah. And the, the publishing company that you got in touch with basically set you a challenge, didn't they? Well, the original idea was that we were going to do essentially um, a week in Tory annual. You know, it's just going to be this year's stuff, uh, and then we'd do another one next year, another one year after that. But when we started looking into the time it would take to go through the legal process, um, we realised that by the time you were reading the the 2021 annual, it would be 2024, because uh, this stuff takes forever, really. Um, so instead of doing that, I just decided that we, rather than trying to tackle one year, I'd just look at everything they've done to date and uh, write it again from scratch. Rather than taking anything that had been on Twitter, I just thought, give people something they haven't seen before and just write all fresh material, which I, I must be stupid. <laughs> uh, it was a, a labour of love. Um, I'm quite proud of it. I think it's um, it's got a lot in it. Uh, as, as anybody who's read it will probably know, there's got a lot in it, um, and I was hoping that it would bring the government down, but it hasn't. So I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got to write another one now, <laughs> have a second shot. <laughs> but also, I mean, um, I, I refer to it being unbound. Other people may have supported schemes like Kickstarter, which is basically somebody has the idea of a book, and you put you, the public, put money into it. And in a way, this is a similar approach it is um unbound do things in the way that they did it 200 250 years ago uh, during her lifetime the only time that jane austen's name appeared in print was as a supporter of somebody else's book um, in 200 years ago that's how all books were published you basically had a subscription service you would say mr james smith is going to write a book would you be interested in supporting it and people would pre-order it, which would fund the author for the time that it took to write in, fund the cost of book setting, uh, of typesetting and binding and all that kind of stuff. And the idea that you give people a, a um, I'm, I'm saying this like I know what I'm talking about. I've done one book, <laughs> but I've learned this in, during the process. Many publishers give a uh, an advance to the author, um, but the advances are really 
quite small. They're, they're not the kind of money that, you know, you hear about Boris Johnson making a half million pound advance. Most people get a four or five thousand pound advance, which is supposed to maintain them for the year it takes them to write a book. It's just not a model that you can really have most people can afford to do i certainly couldn't but uh the way unbound do it is they have a um a subscription service i'm sure there's lots of people i recognize some of you as well have supported this book and have supported the next one as well very very grateful thank you i can feed the dog um so um i think it's a great idea really it basically just makes sure that there is an audience for a book before anybody starts writing it it makes sure that the costs of publishing the book are covered um it means that the authors get more money per book sold uh, compared with a traditional advanced model. Um, the publisher is safe from the risks involved in publishing the book because they know that they've got their costs covered. And, you know, you have an enthusiastic audience to start with, which is, you know, a great thing. It's really, really good thing to have. It's... And your audience came quite quickly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassingly so. I was, I was saying this to John earlier. This genuinely happened up. They said to me, can you publish this book in six... Can you finish the first draft in six months? And I said, well, you know, of course I can. When does the six months start? And they said, well, from the moment you hit your subscriber target, as soon as you hit your subscriber target, the clock is ticking. So I thought, well, that's going to take me a year. So I, they posted the book subscription page uh, on their website, and I tweeted it, and I took the dog for a walk, and when I came back, I'd met my subscription target... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I think I think it was something like thirty eight minutes. I thought, oh crap! I've got to write that I'm thinking now. <laughs> yeah, well, that teaches you to be popular on Twitter, I, I guess. Yeah. I'm you doing know. my best to be unpopular. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the other the, the word you mentioned a moment ago was was satire, and and I just wondered whether you you actually thought yourself in a in a tradition of satirists. Um, he said, being very pretentiously, I mean, there's Juvenal, the great Roman satirist. There's Jonathan Swift. There are the Prince of Gilray or Rowlandson from the 18th, early 19th century, or even Ian Hislop. I, I am often mistaken for Jonathan Swift. It's, <laughs> so I heard. Him and Brad Pitt, I get it all the time. <laughs> no, no. Uh, um, I don't know if I think of myself in terms at all, really. And it still amazes me that I'm writing books. Um, I don't really know where, where I sit. I've had people say that I'm a satirist. I've had people say I'm a journalist and a citizen journalist. Um, I don't really know what I am. I guess it's for everybody else to figure out what I am. If you if you read the book as a satire, is it a satire? It's sardonic, certainly. But I don't know if it's satirical because it's not It's not like Swiftwood with Error One where he just invents a completely new world that is... Um, reflective of the world that we live in this is the world that we live in you know it's it's not it's not a satire in that sense um it is closer to being journalism i i think but it's um i very rarely take many things seriously so i couldn't resist writing jokes as i went along uh, so um it's just jokey journalism i guess I, I mean i was using the word satire as having a very strong morality in it and you know without doubt that comes through at the end of the book, I think, you'll, the, you know, the final chapter. And I want to come back to that later on. But do you think you could be, would you be a scathing about a Labour government if there was one? When there is one? Sorry, I'm going to say that. When there is one? Uh, Next year sometime. Don't forget to vote early. Uh, I think I'm as moral as anybody else, which is to say I have large chunks of immorality in me, just like everybody else does. Everybody's the same. We're all hypocrites and we're all amoral or immoral and selfish and all those things that you condemn other people from doing. If you look at yourself, really, you, everyone does them to a certain extent. I think that there, are, there is a, a category of person who is particularly shameless and that's been embodied in the governments that we've had for certainly the last three or four years. I would go longer than that, but certainly the person of Boris Johnson and the effect that he's had on the operations of government because his poison still leaks through the whole of government, I think, top to bottom. Um, if you look at the the, the scandals and crises, oh, somebody just faints. Um, if you look at the scandals and crises that are going on at the moment, almost all of them have emerged from the Johnson years. I feel, if you can feel sympathy for Sunak, I think I do feel sympathy for him. Because, you know, if you look at all the crises that he's had recently, they're all based on um, the behaviour settings that were put in place by Johnson. So 
I think the immorality that is, that's there in the government exceeds anything that most people have. But satire and morality and labour. I hope I would hold labour to account in my usual way if they did something that I thought was particularly egregious. I don't think my heart would be in it. I don't think I would do in the same way that I have with the Tories to go out looking for the problems um, and investigate them. I don't, I don't think. You know, if, if when Labour take over, if there is some right-wing, centre-right, hopefully, centre-right person who would uh, want to inherit the weakened Tory <laughs> hashtag, I make it uh, fair play, you know. Um, you don't enter politics to have no criticism. And actually, I think criticism of political parties is a vital part of our democratic system. You can't have a government that is not held to account. Um, it just leads to terrible policy. I think that holding holding government to account is a is a critical theme that runs through the book, and I mean you're you're absolutely right about the kind of level of immorality. It's actually it's I think it's even worse than that. I think it's immorality and indolence is the real problem. Yeah. Uh, and when I was I mean I I thought you know looking back at the book, the depressing thought is that since 2010 we've had three pretty inept. Prime Ministers. Five. Five. Well, I was going to come on to them. I'll come on to the other two in a later question. But, you know, there was David Cameron who really knew nothing about work whatsoever. There was Theresa May who at least understood the Protestant work ethic but couldn't get any others, any others in the Cabinet to join her. And there was Boris who wouldn't know work if it bit him, really. Is that is that fair? Yeah, to a certain extent, I think it is. Um, I think all politicians do work fairly hard. They, they work long hours under a lot of pressure. Um, but if you look back at Cameron, this didn't actually make it into the book. There's a, oh, the book was going to be about twice as thick at one point. Um, but this didn't make it into the book. But, it, but while researching this, I, start, I ha kept stumbling on quotes from Cameron where he'd say, um, I, I'm a big fan of... Um, such and such a TV programme. I, I, I really like watching Elementary, which is, a, I haven't even heard of Elementary, but it's a not particular. I've watched a couple of episodes in research. It's a not particularly good modern day version of Sherlock Holmes based in New York. Um, and uh, he said he'd watched every single episode and then he'd watched every, every single episode of Gogglebox and every single episode of this series and that series. And he just listed all these TV programmes that he was watching. And I worked out at one point that if he was telling the truth and he had genuinely watched all these episodes, it was more than 300 days of wall-to-wall -wall television during the time he was in office. Uh, now, it was, he was either lying or he was genuinely sat on his bar lounger with his feet up for a whole year. What Literally, one-fifth of the time he was in office was spent watching TV. Um, and uh, he was either lying all those times he said he liked those programmes, which is perfectly possible, or he was absolutely bone idle. But the more you look into it, the more you find, you know, his, um, his advisors used to complain about the amount of time he spent playing Angry Birds. Um, and we'd elected this man to run the country. And he, it seemed like he wasn't. It seemed like he was just fannying around. Um, but and I, I'm, I'm not trying to defend Cameron because I think many of the things that happened under his watch were indefensible, not least Brexit. But... Um, but if you were to compare him with what came afterwards, I think he at least did come into politics because he genuinely wanted to do things and be things. He wanted to achieve stuff. He had policy agendas and other things that you might not agree with them, but at least they existed. But if you look at Boris Johnson, I don't think he wanted to do prime ministering. He just wanted to be prime minister. In fact, he didn't even want to be prime minister. He wanted to have been prime minister at some point in the past. That, that's all he wanted out of life. He wanted... None of the responsibility, but all the accolades. Um, and at some point, he, he didn't, didn't really have any goals. The, the, the weren't, there wasn't a policy agenda. If you look at the 2019 um, manifesto, it basically says Brexit, and then we might do some other stuff. Um, and, you know, th 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 there was an investigation by the National Audit Office, and they found that there was nothing new in the, in the 2019 Conservative manifesto, with the exception of Brexit. And they saw that Brexit will be done in one month. So you think we elected a government that was basically being given a blank check to do whatever it wanted. Now, <clears throat> Brexit happened and then COVID happened, which took up all the government's time. But you do find yourself wondering what they would have done in 2019 and 2020 if COVID hadn't happened. Because they had no plan, no, no policy agenda whatsoever. 
And I, I think, to a large extent, Sunak is exactly the same. You find yourself thinking, what is the, what's the picture? What, what is it you're trying to do? Other than culture wars, what is the uh, Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting point, because in some respects, politics and government are about the daily grind of doing things. And if you don't know what you're going to do when you're there, then why are you there in the first place? And, you know, one's always thought that the Conservative Party was at least there to keep things as they are. That's the word, isn't it? Conservative, stasis. isn't it? Yeah, stasis. That's, yeah. that's their purpose. If you, if you go back to, as it mentions, you've mentioned the last chapter as well, that was that was the the guiding principle. It was the modern Conservative Party, as, you know, as we know now, was founded by Robert Peel, who was a politician and statesman. He was the guy who started modern day police force and he was highly regarded in his time and he founded the modern day conservative party with the explicit aim of keeping things exactly as they are uh, which is it's a principle it's not one that i particularly agree with but at least it's our principle but they just don't say there is no principle now what is it they're not in favor of keeping things as they are they're not in favor of changing things to something new they're not in favor of teachers or Rail workers or nurses, or who else aren't they in favour of? Well, they're not in favour of judges and lawyers. Um, they're not in favour of newspapers that aren't owned by Johnson, by you know, Hamsworth or Murdoch. Um, they're not in favour of politicians who oppose them. They're not in favour of social media. They're not in favour of industry. They're not in favour of. 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 Wherever you look, they're not in favour of it. And uh, I think if they lose the next general election, it's because they have essentially turned everybody in the country into an enemy of what they imagine their guiding purpose is. But when you look at it, they haven't got a guiding purpose. They just lash out at everybody who objects to them. And it's a stupid way to run a country. It's ridiculous. You couldn't run, you couldn't run a corner shop like that without knowing what you're trying to do a year from now. Um, but that's how they expect the country to run. There's, there's no purpose. I'm gonna, I've got one more question. Then I'm going to give an opportunity for questions from the floor, and then we can come back with a, a final run-up. So um, you rightly corrected me, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of minutes ago. There have been two prime ministers since Johnson. Well, one and a punctuation mark. <laughs> Would you like to say anything about either of them? Not without my lawyer present, no. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as you may know, I'm, I'm writing the follow-up to this, which is um, I've completed the first draft this week. I've got a little bit of editing, and then it's going off to the publishers for them to hack to pieces. Um, but that will cover the the fall of Boris Johnson, the blinking an eye, drive-by Prime Minister Liz Truss, and Rishi Sunak, who's a chatbot with the hair of a Lego Elvis. And, um, yeah, you know, that... Um, you know, I'm hoping that it does the same for them as this has done for David Cameron and Theresa May, and, and they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> they they provoke me. I can't help it. Do you know? I wouldn't have thought that was possible. You know. You know, I, I'm. Uh, I, I think people sometimes get misinterpret what my tone of voice is when I tweet. I uh, I genuinely don't. I don't have anger in me. I don't really get angry. I get frustrated because I find myself thinking, well, there's so many things that need to be done and should be done and could be done. Why aren't they being done? Um, I never get frustrated enough to actually stand for office myself because, God help me, having to having to go out and do pitches and, oh, no, that's not my thing at all. But I'm not, I don't really get angry. I, and I, I think I, I, my instinct is just to laugh at them more than anything. Um, but, yeah, uh, so they provoke me, but they provoke me to laughter more than they provoke me to fury. But that's a very medieval concept, isn't it? I mean, you know... I don't kings, know, I'm not that old. Uh, well, I remember them. I uh, don't... Uh, 1300, don't get me on it. That bloody Thomas a Beckett, I told you. Anyway, I'm just thinking that, um, you know, kings used to have fools who were there to tell them the truth. And that, in a sense, is what a good prime minister ought to have. Somebody behind him saying actually you got that wrong mate yes. you know or you if you do that and that seems to have kind of disappeared now well, maybe that's the role that the citizen journalist has to well play. perhaps but they don't listen to us and they don't like us and they don't care and they don't listen to themselves either there's a quote that i found for the new book which was a, i can't remember which mc said it now my mind's gone blank 
But there was an MP who said the big problem with Boris Johnson is that he's got no friends. It, he, um, and, and the reason for this is because um, he's a, a, a sociopathic narcissist, as anybody who has met him and worked with him attests. You know, there are multiple people who have worked very closely with him um, who have said that he's a sociopathic narcissist. And the problem with, with narcissists is that they don't like other people. They like other narcissists. They're, they're very fond of other narcissists. Um, and the other narcissist that Johnson had in his government was Dominic Cummings. And when Cummings went, he had no longer had anybody in the in government who he trusted to speak to him. The only reason he trusted Cummings was because he was another narcissist. Um, so he, he never had anybody to warn him away from doing the things that he did. He didn't have anybody who was sat behind him, the power behind the throne, speaking truth to power, whether a fool or an advisor or a Cummings Svengali. There was nobody there. He didn't... He's, for somebody who always gave the impression of being, a, you know, this is the, the image it's old. I am a warm, clubbable, lovable guy. I'm, you know, uh, a, a jovial chap who will tell a joke. And um, and it, he's not. That's an act. Um, but also, he, for all that, for all that clubbability that he, um, that was his image, he he just never made any friends in Parliament. He didn't. Nobody liked him, and he didn't like anybody else. He got through on bullying and on winning elections. Um, and when he stopped, you know, he, he's, he, when his popularity plunged, the party turned him in, in a heartbeat. Um, because what's the purpose of somebody that nobody likes if he doesn't get you an election victory? It's a cruel sport, really, politics. And um, but no. The, he had nobody to tell him that he was doing things wrong. And I've not heard of anybody. I've hunted around for who the person behind Sunak is that's doing the same for him. And I can't figure out who it is. I hope that he has somebody, because it's good management to have somebody who is speaking truth to power and whispering in your ear. But Trust didn't have anybody. Um, and I don't see Sunak having anybody other. And I do sometimes wonder if it's sort of a... Um, an ego thing that they don't want anybody telling them they're wrong. That you know they've finally achieved their goal in life, which is the climb of a slippery pole, and the last thing they want is to surround themselves with naysayers. But in the interest of good management, you should. Okay, um, Flora, am I right in thinking we've got a my a roving mic? You're going to take mine. Well, I'll just have to shout then. <laughs> I don't know. No, I've got to it up. Gentlemen, there, third row, the blue top. Thank you. What? What? Your impressions on the Tory party at this point as opposed to the the Whatters? Um, My hope is. Well, I don't know. I think there's two routes. I hope it doesn't go away because, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's a good thing to have a sane, stable, alternative government floating around. It keeps the government is in power on track. Um, you need people standing up in Parliament, questioning them and forcing them to stick to um, agreed policies and agreed standards, without which everything falls apart. So I, I do think that uh, I wouldn't vote for them, but I do think a sane centre-right opposition party is useful. What I do think is that, uh, all to a certain extent, all all governments are a coalition. They're, they all pull together disparate forces around a central thesis. And they attempt to build a government out of that. And that's what the WIPS office is there to make sure that things stay on track. It doesn't always work, but that's the general principle. Um, but I think that the Conservatives, and to a certain extent Labour, are too big a tent. And if we do introduce, after the next election, some sort of form of um, replacement for first-past-the-post, proportional representation, for example, or alternative vote or whatever voting system is decided on, I think the impetus to stay together as a big tent will fall apart. I think that it's likely that you'll end up with a UKP party consisting of Lee Anderson and um, his fellow hangers-on um, who will drift off into the netherworld of idiocy and run their own little culture wars in the backwaters of you know, GB News. Um, and then a sane party will emerge out of the wreckage that will be a more managerial centre-right party that will be recognisable to Ken Clark, for example. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's not a party I'd vote for, but I think it, it should exist to make politics work. 
but I don't know. <laughs> You've obviously got a lot of followers in the room, so you're very much kind of preaching to the converted. What do you think? Uh, what do you think people need to do? Not what do you think we need to do to um, stop that third book coming out? <clears throat> Don't buy the second one. <laughs> Um, vote. It sounds like a simple thing. Vote and tell your friends to vote. Uh, you know, uh, was it something like forty-six percent of people don't vote? You know, um, uh, I'm not sure what. This might be a Tolkien quote. I can't remember. It's from somewhere like that, anyway. That um, people without swords can still die upon them. It might well be Shakespeare. Actually, you'd have to correct me. <clears throat> People without swords can still die upon them. And it's, a, it's a, a thought that I apply to politics often. Even if you're not voting, if you don't have a sword, you're not involved in the fight, doesn't mean that politics isn't going to happen to you. So I think, you know, I, I hope everyone in this room votes. I suspect you all do. But if you have um, younger relatives, particularly the young, don't vote. Vote. And, and don't buy the second book and then I'll go away. <laughs> So, thank you. Oh, yeah, let's share the mic. Um, I mean, towards the, the, the final chapter of your book actually does set out a potential unifying theme behind which I think quite a large part of the big tent of the Tor Tory party could get down, which is about patriotism and doing something to make a better country. Do you want to say us a, give us a little bit about that? It's part of the solution to the last question. Um, well, it's not something that I'd, I think the left is often accused of being unpatriotic or not sufficiently patriotic, or it's particularly something that under the culture wars they are un-British. They don't stand for the ordinary British people. It's something you hear all the time, you know that, that they don't represent the ordinary man in the street. Well, I mean, what the heck, rubber yellow fuck does Rishi Sunak know about the ordinary man in the street? Honestly, what does what does he know? Uh, you know. Uh, uh, I am um, a working class kid from Manchester. I'm middle class now because I've written a book and that's how it works. But, you know, I, I grew up in a council house and left school at 16. And, um, you know, East Manchester is where the stabbings come from. And, you know, uh, that's that's my background. I am a working class kid. Um, and you don't very often hear people from the working classes saying how much they love their country. You very often hear people from the working classes saying how much they love the royal family which is something that they seem to associate, in my experience, seem to associate with patriotism. But I think patriotism has got a hell of a lot more to it than flags and royalty. It's about recognising the important things in your country and the things that make it valuable. And those are things like, I know it's, people talk about it as being our natural religion, the NHS is important. Supporting it, supporting our institutions, supporting the things that make the country operate that's patriotism. You don't need to put a union flag on it. You don't need to stand up when its theme tune is played. You just need to pay sufficient tax to make sure that things keep running. And and then you've got a country. And if you don't, if you hollow out that country, all you end up with is a bunch of wrapping paper, union flag wrapping paper around an empty box. Um, and the emptier the box is, the more important the wrapping paper becomes. So increasingly, all you see is people talking about the flag and talking about, and we'll see it during you know the coronation, talking about royalty and talking about all these things as though they are patriotism, and they're not. Uh, they, they, they are a pastiche of patriotism. The things, I very rarely call myself a patriot, but I suspect I am. I actually quite like Britain. Um, and I want it to work. Um, and I'm prepared to make sacrifices to make it work because I think that's the important thing. The problem I have is there's a whole bunch of people who say they love Britain and are not prepared to make any sacrifice whatsoever to keep it working. They say, I love Britain. Great, pay an extra 1% tax. Absolutely not. They think, well, how the hell do you think Britain's going to carry on working then? Because it clearly isn't now. You only have to look outside. This, this is not a controversial opinion or at least it shouldn't be. If you look around in the place, everything, everywhere you go, is falling apart. 
And uh, I'm often reminded of the quote from Hemingway, I think, which is, there's two characters in one of his books, the sun always, also, always shines, also shines, so also rises, um, who, are, who are talking one and says, oh, how did he go bankrupt? And the other character says, gradually, then suddenly. And this is the gradually. And the next book is the suddenly. Because we have basically cut the country to the bone to a point where it can't withstand the slightest shock, even even normal things, never mind COVID, it can't survive annual flu, which has been going on time immemorial. Um, because we've basically cut the country past, past out, cut about all the muscle, all the flesh, all the fat, cut the bone, cutting into the bone, smashing up the bones, selling the bones to overseas investors. And then we can put them and say, well, why, why is everything falling apart? And my answer is, pay your tax. <laughs> you know, I pay mine. Presumably everybody else pays theirs. If you're on POE, you don't have an option. As soon as you become rich, paying tax becomes an option. It becomes something that you only do if you want to. You can go to tax lawyers and escape from it. And then you find themselves, you know, Sunak, for example, with his, his wife's non-dom status. And, you know, she avoided 12 million tax in one year, which is 3,200 nurses. That's one person. Also, and if she'd have paid that tax, she'd still be worth 700 million pounds. How much money is too much money? How much is enough? If you want to call yourself a patriot, cough up. It's not complicated stuff. Pay for the things that make the country valuable. So when you're talking about the final chapter in this and the morality of it, if there is a morality to it, that's what it is, basically. It's just it's a, it's a, a kind of a in-depth patriotism rather than just surface, because it strikes me that worship of flag and royalty that's, that's just the surface, and it doesn't mean a damn thing. It's worthless. It's it's the wrapping paper that you throw in the bin. Um, and the thing that you actually value is the thing that's in the box, and what we've got now is uh, a country that has been denuded of all that stuff by a deliberate policy of uh, fetishizing low taxation over the value that it provides. That's it. It was... I said it was a serious business as well as, an, and you know, that I think is absolutely it, right? We're all right with this one. We're all right with that one. Last chance for any question. Okay, we've got two here. Let's take the two here. Right, okay. Sorry, I couldn't see at the back. Beg your pardon. Is this working? Yes, it is. Hi. Um, being terribly old, I can even remember that was the week that was coming in on the grainy black and white telly. Do, do you think you could have written the book like that if the public hadn't been warmed up for so many years by things like Private Eye, Have I Got News For You, the news quiz? Uh, I don't know, because I was warmed up by those things as well. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sitting outside of that environment in a way that allows me to comment on it. Um, I don't know. You know, I grew up, the family I grew up in, we took the piss out of everybody and everything. There were, there were no prisoners. So I grew up my natural response to anything that happened is to look for the joke in it because that's what everybody around me did. So, but whether that grew out of TW3 and Peter Cook, I don't know. I think we all owe a great debt to those people because they threw open the doors through which lots of people have brought in. But I, I don't know if I consider myself satirical in the same way that they are. Maybe I am. I don't know. I um, I just want to say I envy you your lack of anger. Uh, I grew up in the Conservative Party. I was actually a member of the Young Conservatives of my teens. I left the party in the mid nineties because I couldn't stand their anti-Europeanism. Now I'm a paid-up member of the Labour Party. I am angry on behalf of my children and my grandchildren. I have seen this government destroy this country. I've seen them take away our right of protest a right of freedom of speech, and so on. And I really fear for the future of my grandchildren. Uh, this is not a question, it's a statement, because I've got a microphone that Flora gave me. <laughs> just, just, pass it, just pass it on, I think everybody would say the same thing. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I, I kind of wish I could get angry sometimes, but um, there's plenty of ammunition for somebody who wants to get angry. I just sometimes wonder whether it achieves anything. I sometimes look at people... Ra well, I, I sometimes think this. I, th I think two things. First of all, wouldn't a riot be wonderful? 
And then I think, no, no, because riots end up with broken teeth and blood and guts, and it's awful. And all those things are terrible things that happen. And the second thing, I think, is that the reason we don't have riots in this country is because we have um, satire. And laughing at something is like um, releasing the pressure valve. You've laughed at it, and then, oh, right, I feel better now, I've laughed at that. And I sometimes wonder if, if I, if, I'm not saying I'm an important figure in any of this at all, but if the, if the satirists shut up for a year, if we all went away for a year, if we just have a revolution, <laughs> because, you know, the pressure valve will go away and suddenly people would get angry instead. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid if anyone's taken to the barricades, I won't be there. I'll be at home with my feet up and a nice whiskey. I don't think we should forget the uh, international workers' slogan of don't get angry, get even. <laughs> Hello, my name's Claire. Um, I'm afraid you've really preempted what I was going to say, which was um, I, I watched the Iron Lady film the other day and it just made me realise how completely mad Thatcher was again. And through that film, you saw the Brixton riots, the Toxteth riots, you saw the miners, you saw people sp you know, spilling blood and it being such an awful place. But to me, you can have humour, but we all sit back and just say, release the pressure, and then nothing happens, nothing's changing. What do you think is really going to make people change and not put up with this vapping paper anymore? Because <laughs> unless the governments don't respond, do they, unless there is a bit of a riot, unless there is a bit of a concentration of emotion? Um, I don't know what's going to make it change. I suspect newspapers, it, it sounds like a strange thing to say, um, you should never speak ill of the dead. I was always taught this, don't speak ill of the dead. But Rupert Murdoch's still alive, so make the most of it while you can. <laughs> <laughs> but the moment he falls off the perch, I suspect that an awful lot of things are going to disintegrate. There's, there's, uh, it's on record that two of his children want to dismantle Fox News in the US, and I suspect that there will be similar moves to dismantle some of the things that he's done in the UK. And um, I, I think an, an the only way that the Conservative Party has managed to survive in its current form for as long as it has is because of um, vigorous support, let's say, from um, the newspapers that have captured a lot of the daily. It's not just the Daily Mail. Uh, I remember reading quite recently that the, the BBC Today programme used to read the Daily Mail in the morning before they went on air and base their talking points around what the Daily Mail had said. And it doesn't matter whether they're um, what tone they they discuss those issues. The BBC can be as objective as it wants to be, or it claims to be, during those discussions. But the talking points themselves are dictated by what comes out of the Daily Mail. So you're not going to have things discussed that are not the obsessions of the Daily Mail. So all they're going to talk, it doesn't matter if they're objective about it, they're going to talk about migration. And if you talk about migration, that's all people hear about. So they become obsessed with migration. Um, I find myself, it's quite interesting. I was, I was thinking about the term woke recently, and I find myself realising that nobody says political correctness gone mad anymore, which means exactly the same thing as woke, which is to say it means nothing at all. Um, but, you know, that term got, it's laughable now. It's a joke. It's a punchline. People say polit it's political correctness gone mad, and everyone does a polite English chuckle about the whole thing because we understand that it means nothing. But you start talking about woke, and they they react with the same fury they did about political correctness gone mad 20 years ago. And 20 years from now, woke will be a punchline as well. But the, the obsessions from which these terms arise, and the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and the things that govern our national conversation, will be the same. I think those things will change um, when Murdoch falls off his perch and hopefully, hopefully, we'll have something like Leveson 2, which was cancelled, which will uh, adjust the way in which the... One thing we could do quite quickly and easily is the same thing that they do in the US, which is in the US, you're not allowed to run a media channel unless you're a US citizen. Um, and you have to be in the country. We could go one further than that and say not only do you have to be in the country, and the, the, the owning, the, the company which owns the media business has to be in the country. It also has to pay a minimum amount of taxation in the country. And we could set that up. For example, we could say you have to pay a minimum of 38% taxation, which is the average amount that people lose in their income. So if we would say to a business, you can run a newspaper in this country, 
but 38% of the money that goes through that goes to taxation, and you have to be registered in the UK, and all your directors have to be British citizens. And then you would very quickly see people who are using our... Uh, Jonathan Harmsworth, for example, who is the guy, the, the lead chairholder of the Daily Mail. He lives in France, in Monaco, for taxation purposes. He's a non-dom. He doesn't pay tax in this country. And he basically dictates what the national conversation is. Um, I don't think that should be allowed. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it should be allowed, even if it was somebody who was supporting the Labour Party. I just don't think it should be allowed. If you're going to be part of this country, be part of this country, and that that's everything. That's the responsibilities, taxation, for example, as, as well as the benefits. You know, they, they come hand in hand. Um, which is, you know, going back to what I was saying about patriotism. It's I, I kind of believe this stuff. I sound naive. There's probably plenty of people who are very wealthy who say, yeah, but you don't have to pay tax. You can, you can hide it in Monaco. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. Um, and there are legislation, the points of legislation that could be introduced very quickly and easily that could change that radically. Um, I, I was saying to Rob earlier, if you, there's a lot of criticism at the moment of, of um, Starmer. People are saying, well, we don't know what he believes in and we, he's not, not said enough about his policies, and it's all a bit vague. Um, and in writing this, I found myself rereading a lot of old news, and some of the stuff I found quite interesting. If you look back to 95, two years before the Blair landslide, everyone was saying exactly the thing about, about Blair. What does he stand for? He's not introduced. He's only got five policies, and they can all fit on a credit card. You know, he's got these little cards that you have, and he's only got five policies. What does he mean? And then two days after he came into office... Um, we got an in independent Bank of England, which had never been discussed during the entire two-year run-up to the general election campaign. But he was in his back pocket. He knew what he wanted to do. And he came into office with a, a roster of policies which often hadn't been announced beforehand, not been discussed, never been major things. wouldn't shock me. I don't know this, but it wouldn't shock me if it's exactly the same with Starmer. He's saying as little as he can to make as few enemies as possible before he goes into a general election. Uh, but I hope, I hope, touch any bit of what I can find, I hope that it will be a lot more radical and that among the things he will bring in will be uh, legislation to change the way in which newspaper ownership happens in this country. And I think that would have a radical change in the amount that people, in the way that um, people discuss politics, whether from the left or the right. Well, thank you very much, Russell. I mean, I think what I expected, I, I now confess, and I have already confessed this to Russell, that when... Flora and Dave Wakeley said to me, would you do this interview with Russell Jones about this book, Decade in Tory? I thought, oh, no, not an anti-Tory wine I, I from the too. left. <laughs> oh, God, you know. It's not. I mean, what I think the book opened my eyes to was the power of language, and I think we've heard that this evening, the power of humour and the power of morality. And I think we've had all of those things from Russell tonight. So thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Thank you very much. But he's not going yet because he's going to give us a little treat from book two, which we hope isn't going to be published. Obviously. This might be the only time you get to hear this. <laughs> so um, this covers the period immediately after Boris Johnson's resignation. And so Boris Johnson became the third successive prime minister to have their career destroyed by Boris Johnson. <laughs> Yet he couldn't even get that much right. After he delivered his humility-free resignation from the steps of Downing Street, a senior government source told journalists that speech was a fucking disgrace. You'd think his resignation would mean he'd resigned, but no, the Tories, ever sticklers for tradition, proved incapable of getting exit done, and Johnson stayed in Downing Street, barely even pretending to lead the country anymore. He couldn't be bothered to turn up to three separate Cobra meetings about various crises, instead opting to throw a party for himself. He'd learned his lesson, clearly. And then it was back to cosplaying, this time dressing up as top crews to arse around in an RAF jet, like the honey monster being cast in a knockoff movie called Top Gunt. <laughs> it was at this stage in the proceedings that the government chose to stage a no confidence vote in itself. 
Labour had wanted a confidence vote to shift Johnson out of Downing Street as fast as possible so that somebody, anybody, could start addressing the cost of living crisis. But Johnson didn't really care about that. He just wanted to save his skin for another few hours and he cried the entire thing as a deep state plot to reverse Brexit. Yet the only way he could avoid judgment on his own leadership was to call for a confidence vote in the entire government instead. They won because not even this lot would be stupid enough to bring down their government while they were 25% 25 points behind in the polls. Yet even so, they couldn't get through the process without a fiasco. Tobias Elwood, the chair of the Commons Defence Committee, was stripped of the Conservative whip and made to sit as an independent because he'd missed the vote. He'd been in Moldova before heading to the front line in Ukraine as part of his job promoting the Prime Minister's efforts there. And he couldn't make it start back because of, travel, because of travel chaos currently being overseen by Dominic Raab. So they effectively sacked him for being pretty much the only minister still doing his job. <laughs> for the rest of the Tories, it was time to begin the first leadership election of the year. Their top priority was to urgently find a new PM who could prove to the nation that the squalid Boris Johnson was the exception to the norm. Quick and clean, that's what was needed. This doesn't entirely explain why the party decided the leadership campaign should deprive Britain of a functioning government for an epic eight weeks. That's longer than practically any modern general election. And as for clean, more than one candidate immediately licked dossiers listing the seediness of their rivals. Details included the use of hard drugs, prostitutes, tax dodges, illegal loans, and what one Tory source described as explicit photographs that could be used for compromise. None of this boded well. But then the boding got even worse when a perfectly ludicrous 14 candidates threw their hats into the ring. Or 11, if you only count Grant Chaps once. <laughs> Under party rules, in order to stand, a candidate needed nominations from just eight MPs, but Ben Wallace, who'd been favourite just days earlier, couldn't even scrabble together that many, so decided to simultaneously remain Defence Minister and a life model for ornamental rubber doorstops. And so the competition began. Enter the Dunderdome. The pantheon of non nuttery began with Liz Truss, dragged away from Instagram long enough to fill in the application form to become PM. Truss gained widespread support from the usual suspects, Jacob Rees-Mogg, Jonathan Gullis, Mark Francois, Daniel Kowinski, catalogue models for the extremes of the human form, and entirely unconcerned that Truss emitted the energy of Philomena Kunk battling to understand the offside rule. <laughs> she was what they wanted, and don't let them forget it. Truss's response to the massive unpopularity of Boris Johnson was first to design, define herself as the Boris Johnson continu continuity candidate, and then to deny she was the Boris Johnson continuity candidate at all, heavily foreshadowing the stability and fortitude which became her trademark. Some people boast that they are single-minded, single -minded, but Truss's dedication to efficiency had got her down to a lot less than that. By stark contrast, Jeremy Hunt pitched that he was a caring, intelligent and competent man, a claim only slightly undermined by the fact that he couldn't remember the nationality of his own wife. <laughs> it's certainly true that he was a least, least fist-chewingly right-wing major candidate, predominantly by keeping his absolutely horrible political views static, while the rest of the party goose-stepped off to find even horribler ones. In normal circumstances, a candidate for PM being technically sane would be an advantage. Not so with this electorate, which consisted almost entirely of furious 80-year-olds from Guildford who earnestly believed they were living in the movie Zulu. This reduced Hunt's chances of victory to practically zero. So to increase his appeal, he selected Esther McVeigh as, as his running mate and described her as a star. Perhaps the star he meant was a white dwarf, which the physicists among you will know is an incredibly dense thing that produces absolutely no material of work and rapidly collapses. <laughs> the other big hitter was Rishi Sunak, standing to become Prime Minister so he could overturn the economic legacy of Rishi Sunak. <laughs> Most people's gut reaction was, this can't be our Prime Minister. He looks like he's barely out of short trousers. And then the camera panned down. Everyone realised he was barely in them. Every ensemble ended mid-shin, as though he'd ordered a range of vastly expensive business suits that came with capri pants. Regardless, his campaign got off with it to a blistering start, with a fellow PM describing him as a treacherous bastard, and the nation reminding him that we weren't thrilled at the prospect of replacing the guy who was fined for illegally partying with the other guy who was fined for illegally partying. <laughs> Sunak 
quick, quickly flipped through the Rolodex of things a man with no beliefs can claim and pulled out the card labelled Honesty Candidate. Unfortunately, this didn't entirely square with the subterfuge surrounding his family's tax affairs, so his next idea was to proclaim himself a serious candidate for a serious time. Fat chance. We also remembered him as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who didn't know how to use a credit card at the garage where he'd taken a Kia Rio that he pretended he was driving. Days into his campaign, and with two false starts already under his tiny, tiny belt, Sunak then told fellow MPs that his only weakness was striving too hard for perfection, before appearing in front of a Ready for Rishi campaign banner, on which he'd misspelt the word campaign. <laughs> it's almost impossible to satirise this shit, but I'll try. Grant Shapp stood out <clears throat> by refusing to get, to get himself drawn into the anti-trans debate, which is the only recorded instance of, Sh of Grant Shapps having clarity about an identity. Thank you. His unwillingness to pick on a minority wasn't the only reason Shapps gained little support from the culture warriors on his back benches. The last time Grant said he'd help me win an election, said one Tory, I nearly ended up in prison. <laughs> Shall we put him down in the maybe column? Tom Tugendat did well in the contest, either despite or because of his zero ministerial experience. He'd been fiercely critical of the shallow, moronic approach of Johnson, with his endless repetition of three-word three slogans and careless lack of understanding about the Brexit he was selling us. So Tugendat launched a campaign using a two-word slogan, repeating Clean Start 16 times during a single short TV interview. He then went on to prove his grasp of detail by proposing a new Viking alliance of nations which he described as not all in the EU and said would consist of Ireland, which is in the EU, Iceland, which is in the EU, Sweden, which is in the EU, and Norway, which is an associate member of the EU. <laughs> Kenneth Badenoch had spoken of her aspiration to be Britain's first black prime minister but it looked like she'd be Britain first's black prime minister after that fascist organisation gave her their backing. She proudly opposed net zero climate policies on day one of her campaign, then you turned on day two, telling her hustings that she would definitely commit to net zero. And then she you turned again, telling another audience that she would delay net zero. Thatcher had said, the lady's not for turning. Badenoch spun, spun round so much, she'd be a more effective member of society if you painted M.O.T. up one side of her, test on the other, and plonked her on the pavement outside quick fit. <laughs> but keen to bolster her position as the anti-woke candidate, she held a second campaign launch, at which unisex toilet cubicles were pointlessly bestrewn with makeshift men and ladies signs, as though the culture wars had turned it into some sort of effluent-obsessed very woke house. Somehow, even this made her more relatable than Nadim Zahawi, who was now in charge of the nation's money, but seemingly couldn't even keep track with what was happening with his own. His leadership hopes lasted barely a week, not least because when asked about the non-dom tax haven status of his own vague wealth, he told Sky News, I don't think it's right to go into numbers, because I'll probably get it wrong. <laughs> also, can I be Prime Minister? <laughs> Zahawi launched his bid for power with a tagline that looked like a leak of his Facebook password, NZ4PM. He wanted everybody to know that he'd reached high office as a result of fierce competence and laser-like focus on the details. But if you visited NZ4PM.com, it took you to the leadership page of Penny Bordant. <laughs> That's a real person, by the way, not a minor Adams, Ad Adams family character. There were rumours that Reese Mogg would throw his top hat into the ring, and if he teamed up with Morgan we could simply cancel Parliament and replace it with repeats of the Munsters. But, but Mog didn't stand, so we were left with Mordant bringing to the contest all the dazzling skills we'd come to expect from a Tory leader. She was a former magician's assistant who'd failed to make it to the top ten in a celebrity diving show. To avoid discussing the vast gap in useful experience she could bring to the role, Mordant concentrated on reminding the public that she'd been a reservist in the Royal Navy, and therefore, perhaps more than any candidate, she said, she understood the military. This must have come as a surprise to Tom Tugendat, a lieutenant colonel who'd served in Iraq and <laughs> Afghanistan. It also startled those who'd recalled she'd been defence secretary for a mere 85 days. It definitely stunned senior officers from the Navy, because they reported, she isn't currently a trained or paid reservist, she's never qualified or been commissioned, 
and complained that the martial fervour with which she represented herself was deeply misleading. One of her medals was a badge for drinking rum, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and her rank, commander, was merely honorary after her 12 gruelling weeks chairing peacetime meetings at the Ministry of Defence. Daniel Craig held the same honorary rank for playing James Bond. <laughs> when she wasn't getting hammered or pretending to be Captain Pugwash, Mordaunt was demonstrating her competence for the, good, for the job of PM via a heartwarming campaign video featuring footage of convicted murderer Oscar Pistorius, who didn't complain, and Johnny Peacock, who did. He's a Paralympian who hadn't given permission to appear in the video and demanded to be removed. So her campaign had to be edited and relaunched two hours after it started. She immediately gained the backing of non-league Tory backbencher Jack Brereton, who you'd assume would be a natural Sunak fan, given that he managed to spell his own name wrong on a leaflet, in which he, in which he, he's, he reassured his constituents that he would continue with the levelling of Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> Don't laugh. It can't be easy to only make it halfway to being an idiot savant. Yet Brereton still somehow managed to outperform Steve Baker. Baker's opening, and as it turned out, closing gambit, revolved around a poster with a design seemingly stolen from a gym in the 80s. Behind an image of Baker were a random smattering of squiggles and non-geometric shapes, one of which intersected with his head to make it look like he'd been struck with a meat cleaver. That was strange enough, but then we get to his tagline. Obama went with, yes we can. Johnson plumped for, get Brexit done. Baker took a radically different approach and opted for, I will be relaunching Conservative Way Forward to redefine the territory which the Conservative Party runs. <laughs> Perhaps worried that this rolled off the tongue a bit too easily, Baker had printed it using five different font sizes. The end result looked like a riddle in the style of an eye test, performed by a smug optician with a hatchet through the brain. Unsurprisingly, his campaign ended, and I mean this very literally, before it had even begun, and he lent his backing to Suella Braverman, a human-sized guinea pig that had mindlessly gnawed its way through very nearly half of international law for dummies. Presumably on the basis that she believed this is what the party, nay the country, was crying out for, Braverman or should we call her Heinrich Hamster, or maybe Joseph Gerbils, <laughs> ran a leadership bid based on a promise to eliminate rules protecting everybody from being tortured. If it's becoming hard to keep up with the sheer number of ludicrous candidates, brace yourself for the previously, and indeed subsequently, unheard of Raymond Chishti, who had been seemingly invented merely so he could be defeated, like a nameless pre titles bad guy in a Bond movie. You, Gov, didn't even list him in their, include him in their list of politicians by popularity. And bear in mind that list even include disgraced idiot Neil Hamilton, who hadn't been an MP since 1997. It didn't help that Tristy's bid for power began with a publicity photo that aimed for staring at manifest destiny, but came across as, I can't work out how to use the toilet on this train. <laughs> he gained the support of literally nobody, backed the losing Tugendhat before doubling down and backing the losing Sunak, and then, poof, he was gone, like a dream that never was. Fortunately, this lot were quickly little down to just eight remaining characters. Kenny Badenock, Mary Wokehouse, Liz Truss, Mary Madhouse, Rishi Sunak, Mary Poorhouse, Suella Bravman, Mary Workhouse, Tom Tugendhat, Mary Guardhouse, Penny Mordant, Larry Alehouse, Nadheem Zahawi, Scary Shithouse, and Jeremy Hunt, Dopey Titmouse. Well, once again, Russell, thank you very much for keeping us so entertained. Um, copies of the book are available uh, for both purchase and signing. Thank you, Waterstones. I think everybody else had a great long list of people to thank, so I'm going to pass it over to John because I haven't got it in front of me. But thank you all for coming, and thanks, Russell, for speaking to us. Thank you.